put me in the corner dan oh my god okay as you guys can see the title darkest moments in tv history now i'm already uh locked in okay but from the title itself so good luck i'll see you guys on the other side bro Fuck. I need a water bottle. Oh my god. It was a typical day in the world of daytime television. Infomercials, soap oh, operas, and highly scripted legal shows filled viewer screens. With one of the more popular at the time being a program called Christina's Court. Okay. Today. In Christina's court. Dude, Emerald Knight gifted the show sub. centered around Thank a you. woman named Christina Perez, giving counsel and advice to those wrapped up in legal drama. And on this particular morning, comedian Sean Harris would be featured filing suit against his ex-girlfriend in the hopes of recouping unpaid rent. In, every month it would be something different, you know? Like what? Dude, I, these little, like, court disputes on these shows are so fucking funny. Do you guys ever watch these? It's like a hundred dollar dispute, bro. And... To be fair, $100 might be a lot for fucking some people, right? And $100 is a good amount of money. But to go to court for that is fucking insane, in my opinion, bro. I got this month because I got to do this or that. I'm like, man. So I you mean... let her go nine months without paying rent. Now, like I said, these shows were very obviously scripted, at least to some degree. And with Sean himself being a professional comedian, it led to countless funny moments and what turned out to be one of the show's more iconic episodes, with by far the most memorable moment coming at the very end, when okay. things seemed to deviate from the script. Constantly like a child in my people own love, house. People love, they yell at each other. Oh, that's true. That's Ask him, he's been married for how long? Over look at him though, he look mad. <laughs> you don't look happy, brother. You don't look happy. Okay. Here, we see the comedian take aim at Christina's bailiff, a man named Renard Spivey, who was an integral part of the show, being the judge's sidekick for years and years. Though it wasn't often that he found himself at the end of a joke like this, as Sean suggests that Renard looked unhappy when it was revealed that he had been married for over 27 years. He's very happy. Okay, all right, let's get back to the point. What's so weird about that? All in all, it made for a rather charming moment, with viewers adoring the lighthearted jab aimed at one of the show's most beloved characters. <laughs> though no one could have known at the time just how true that joke about his happy marriage would turn out to be. Wait, what? Still developing tonight, a Harris County Sheriff's deputy facing serious charges. 63-year-old Renard Spivey accused of killing his wife, 52-year-old Patricia Spivey, after an argument that turned deadly. Yo! What? Yo, I'm mind blown right now. KPRC Channel 2's Bill Barama. On July 28th, 2019, over a decade after the aforementioned program aired, Renard Spivey was confronted by his wife, Patricia, about what she believed to be steroid use or perhaps even infidelity. Oh my and in God. the midst of this heated argument, Spivey would draw his gun and shoot his wife once in the arm and then in the chest. Dude, what the f Shortly after, police would find her lifeless body crumpled in their bedroom closet. Now, after years and years of taking part in this once famed legal show, Spivey can be found alone in his prison cell, where he'll likely remain for the Whoa. next 14 years of his That's life. That's insane. Is that is that categorized as a roid rage? I, like, I... That's insane. Or murdering the woman that he was I mean, he so was, happily married to. They were arguing was about the roids. One of Court's most iconic moments into one of the darkest examples of irony in all of television history. That, that blew my mind, actually, right there. When you find a good woman, you got to hang on for dear life because then it's hard to find another. So my advice as a happy woman, married woman. Yo, fire editing, bro. Nick Crowley. This is my first time watching a Nick Crowley video, I think. Before we get any further, I want to thank Scentford for sponsoring oh, this yeah, for sure. a fragrance Me too. without having yep, yep, yep. a perfect I know. Yep, to smell good, don't smell like shit. With some yep. US oh, wow, you're getting your bag, huh? Chapter 2. 
Tetushi Yagita's Fall. The world of television is an interesting one. Despite the highly controlled and well-polished products that we're typically used to seeing on our screens, there have been a surprisingly high number of deeply disturbing moments that have happened when on air, and this potentially new series aims to highlight some of the most disturbing. And what better way to start than with a relatively unknown case that has haunted me for years. Okay. <laughs> Saturday, June 14th, 2008, a Japanese TV station called Television Miyazaki is running its standard live programming, which on this day was set to feature a game show-like segment in the remote rice fields of Takachi Hocho. The game itself was simple. Competitors stood back to back on a small wooden stand above the shallow muddy water below, and when given the cue, they would attempt to shove their opponent into the water without like turning backwards? their bodies around. Yeah. In the end, the one left standing on the Yo, I'm just saying, chat, y'all would all be fucked, okay? My ass, you guys know I got that dumper, bro. You would be in that mud so quick. Every single one of you platform would be declared the winner, with the loser being left humiliated in the mud. Just saying. Oh shit. Oh, you're fucked. Round one goes off without a hitch, resulting in the losing contestant being covered head to toe in a thick brown sludge, Ugh. with the whole atmosphere perfectly encapsulating the craziness and high energy charm that you would expect from a Japanese game show made at the time. And so far, everything was all in good fun, with this excitement only escalating as the contestants convince one of the show's hosts, a man named Tasuchi Yanagida, to join in on the competition. Okay. <laughs> Dude, this takes a dark turn? How? It took some convincing, but eventually Tetsuchi agrees to compete, much to the enjoyment of everyone spectating. And from there, the comedy writes itself, as immediately after the round starts, it's apparent that he stood little to no chance. <laughs> Damn. And upon instantly losing his balance, Tasuki reacts in a split second and dives off the platform, landing headfirst into the muddy water below, oh my God. which causes his body to fall limp. Oh! The, the water that he had just dove into was merely six inches deep, with the rest consisting of a thick layer of mud, which his head would strike directly, instantly causing his neck to break. And in that very moment, Tatsuchi would be irreversibly paralyzed, leaving him unable to move from the neck down. What? It was a tragic accident. However, the accident itself is far from the most awful part of this live broadcast, with that coming immediately after. Unaware of Tatsuchi's severe injury, the crew believed that he was merely playing a prank on them and just joking around, and so they left him there face first in the water, and proceeded to shove his face even deeper and deeper into the mud, Yo! splashing even more on top of his head to rub in the fact that he had lost. He doesn't die, right? They had no idea that during their antics, Hasuchi was in a desperate fight for survival, as in those six inches of water, he was slowly drowning, no. and completely unable to pick up his head to breathe. Bro! This lasts for an excruciatingly long 15 seconds before they be- Dude, I thought you were about to say 15 minutes. <laughs> you let that man lay in the mud for 15 minutes? Begin to bob his head up and down, and eventually pull Tasuchi's face out of the water. Dude! But this reprieve was short-lived, as the contestants proceed to drop him back into the mud face first. <laughs> Dude, what the fuck? It is so incredibly painful to watch, and made oh. all the more disturbing with the over-the-top hysterical Yo, laughter this one's creepy, coming from everyone bro. around him who are completely oblivious to the situation in front of them. Finally, after what feels like an eternity, Tasuchi is hoisted above the water and the camera switched back to the main broadcast, ending both Tasuchi's and the viewer's pain. 
By some stroke of good fortune, Tasuchi would survive the ordeal, but just barely, as it's estimated that even just a few more seconds in that mud would have likely Dude. led to his death. I mean, W, he lived. This wasn't the case. And according to his Facebook page, Tasuchi has learned to live with his body wide paralysis and even went on to rejoin the show years later in some capacity. Let me get W in the chat for this, man. Holy shit, bro. Ending this entry off on somewhat of a bright spot despite this otherwise being one of the more unsettling and appalling broadcast accidents Dude, that I've ever seen. Dude, broke his neck in the mud? Chapter 3, The Awakening. Yo, I just want to say, this video is amazing. You guys agree? I'm glad I picked this one to watch right now. This video is great. It's fucked up, but it's really good. On the topic good. of broadcasts that have left an impression on my life, I would say none have had more of an emotional impact than a story run by 60 Minutes about a man named Donald Herbert. The story starts back in 1995, just four days after Christmas, when a fire broke out in a home in Buffalo, New York. In an attempt to put out the blaze, firefighter Donald Herbert was standing on the roof of the building when suddenly it gave way. As a result, Herbert would fall into the attic where he would be trapped in the smoke, no. unable to breathe. He would lay there without oxygen for six whole minutes no. before they finally were able to pull his body to safety, with the whole ordeal being filmed and shown on local news. Somehow, Herbert managed to survive this accident, w. but being without air for that long caused him to lose most of his brain function, leading to him spending the following years in a minimally conscious state, unable to eat, unable to breathe, and seemingly unable to understand the world around him. What? Eventually, his condition led to him being placed in a nursing home, where a feeding tube was the only thing keeping him alive. Dude. For all intents and purposes, the man was gone. Dude. Is like you're not even you anymore, bro. I feel like you're just dude, as fucked up as it sounds, like you're almost being held hostage by your body, you know, at that point. Like, you're just not you. Oh, it's such that's such a like a hard I don't then, know. Something happened. What? On April 20th, 2005, a staggering nine and a half years after his accident, Donald Herbert woke up. Wha In the nursing home where he had spent most of the years unresponsive, he would suddenly turn to a nurse and ask for his wife, Linda, while displaying signs of being fully lucid, which prompted the staff to immediately call his family who rushed to see him. Wait, and sure enough, despite Herbert being completely blind, he was not only fully responsive, but recognized almost all of his family members. The moments following were all captured by cameras and later shown on an episode of 60 Minutes, with the footage being some of the hardest hitting and emotional that I've personally Damn. ever seen. I kind of want to watch it. <laughs> How long have I been gone? Quite a while, pal. Quite a while. Dude, this is fucked up. 10 years. The pain in discovering that he had been gone for 10 years, all that time missed, robbed from a man who was just doing his job, is indescribably gut-wrenching. But it's what happens after this footage that proves to be the most upsetting part. What? For nearly 16 hours, the newly awakened man spoke with his family, catching up on every little detail that he had missed. And though from that point on he had moments going in and out of his lucidity, his long-term prognosis actually seemed hopeful. Throughout the next few weeks, Donald was surrounded by family members at all times, not only to take advantage of every single second that Herbert was awake, but also for his own safety as well. As since his awakening, he would thrash violently in his sleep, as if he still believed he was trapped in that blaze. Dude. And so to ensure his safety, at least one family member would be stationed with the man while he slept. Though on one night, one of the family members on duty had grown too exhausted to stay any longer. And from the first time since he became lucid, Donald Herbert was left alone. Dude. And during that night, he would again start to thrash violently, with Herbert flailing so hard that he would fall out of his bed and strike his head against the floor, causing his brain to start bleeding. From that moment on, Donald Herbert would never become lucid again. And as a result of his injuries, he would pass away one year later from pneumonia. Bro. Dude.
That's you know what this reminds me of? Final Destination. Like that's what it reminds me of. Like you somehow survive, but it but like dude, it's that's fucking insane, bro. You somehow survive and it just like will not stop. Like, oh my god, let me get an RIP. Yo, how bad does that uh family member feel? Dude. Anyone had ever oh my god, the Twilight Zone? Chapter 4? Twilight Zone incident? Wait, incident? The Twilight Zone. Throughout its lengthy run, this television series provided some of the most entertaining and memorable moments in all of television. But for this section, I'm going to be cheating a little bit, as rather than looking at an event surrounding the show this itself, video is amazing, I'll bro. be highlighting the far less memorable movie version of the series. Hey chat, let me know, should we Simply watch more Nick Crowley in the Zone future, bro? The, I, like, I the film was broken this. up into multiple sections, serving as sort of an anthology work with three separate storylines. And for the sake of this story, only one section and really only one scene bears discussion. The scene was intended to simulate a battle in the Vietnam War, in which the protagonist, a character played by actor Vic Morrow, is attempting to outrun an attack helicopter and escape the area. The footage was intended to serve as the section's dramatic Wait. conclusion, with it being described as the following. Do I remember this? In the this? scene that served as the original ending, Bill, the character portrayed by Maro, stumbles into a deserted Vietnamese village, where he finds two young Vietnamese children left behind when a U.S. Army helicopter appears and begins shooting at them. Morrow was to take both children under his arm and escape out of the village as the hovering helicopter destroyed the village with multiple explosions. Based on that description alone, shooting the scene was going to be tricky and likely a very intense process on the set, as all the effects used were set to be done practically, meaning that they would require an actual helicopter and real pyrotechnics. Not only this, but the director, a man named John Landis, wanted to use actual child actors for the scene, which given that it was planned to take place at night and near explosions, was technically illegal in the state of California. Despite the laws in place, however, Landis decided to shoot the scene regardless, enlisting seven-year-olds Mika Din Lee and six-year-olds Rene Xin Yi Chen to play the roles of the Vietnamese children. And with all the pieces now in place, the cameras began to roll on what was set to be the stunning conclusion to this particular section. Okay, so he's carrying the two kids. There's fucking a lot of shit going on. There's a helicopter above him? As the scene starts, the spectacle of it all can't be understated, as the lighting, setting, and the pyrotechnics truly set a haunting tone. However, unbeknownst to the production team, there was a major problem developing. As stated prior, all the effects you see here are real, and during the scene, there was an actual helicopter flying just above the Dude, actors, what? which by itself was already very dangerous, and made even more so due to the pyrotechnics. For Why the pilots, did they go this the explosions insane, bro? launched in the air created fireballs in the sky, making things much more difficult to navigate. Dude, don't tell me those the kids on the ground blow up were and never shit, made dude. aware of this. And being pressed to make things look even more and more intense, the crew decided to double down on their explosions, launching two massive charges back to back. I can't even see a decision that proved to be a costly one as the second blast was so strong that it dislodged the helicopter's tail prop, causing the craft to spin uncontrollably. And no. within mere seconds, as the cameras roll on the three actors trudging their way through the water, the craft crashes directly on top of them. Somehow, everyone on board the helicopter survived the wreck, though those on the ground weren't so lucky, as in one split second, the blade of the helicopter slashed into Vic Morrow and Mika Din Lee, instantly decapitating them. And as the craft slammed to the ground, Rene Shin Yi Chen would be crushed beneath its massive weight. In one frame, there were three living actors, and in the next, there were none. What the? In retrospect, Yo. it's not hard to see the red flags and the dangerous practices what being the used fuck? by the production team. However, following- Dude, why would they use such real shit? Why'd they use real explosions, real pyrotechnics, real helicopter? Bro. 
In several long legal battles, no one would be found liable in the deaths of the three actors, Decapitated. and Landis himself would go on to enjoy an incredibly successful career. The Twilight Zone film would eventually be released years later, only with a different ending. Dude. Oh, they're not gonna demolish it. There's no Chapter 5, in. Albert Dryden. I'll force with force. Dude, I could watch a fucking three-hour video of this shit. Our final story takes us to the quaint countryside of Buttsfield, England, where a man named Albert Dryden had been living a fairly solitary life. Following his retirement from steelworking, Albert dedicated his life to building up a plot of land which he had purchased in the area. His main goal was to construct a bungalow for his elderly mother where she could live during the summers, while also planning to build some sort of fallout bunker on the same plot. What? But right from the start, he ran into issues, as his permit request to build these structures on his land was promptly denied. This did not stop Dryden, however, as despite the ruling, he began his construction anyway, believing he had found a workaround with the law, as rather than building the house in a standard manner, he instead dug a deep hole into the ground and began to construct his home there, labeling it as the home in a hole. Due to this, the home only stood about 8 feet or so above the ground, which Dryden believed made the construction legal. However, he was wrong in his assumption, and the building swiftly caused a disagreement between the man and the Derwentside District Council, with this rift growing more and more amplified as time went on. In the midst of this ordeal, a man named Harry Collinson was appointed as chief of the council and assigned to handle the case as his first order of business, and he did so by initially sending Dryden a letter demanding that he stop construction and also tear down what he had already built. Dryden, however, decided to counter with a court appeal, which was swiftly denied, leading to the- Yo, there's a lot of shit, a lot of shit going on in this one, man. You know what I'm saying, chat? A lot of, a lot of, a lot of information to take in and shit, man. The court's final order that the building be demolished within three months. It so there's a house the not supposed to be there? News began to document We're the supposed to build the house type Dryden shit? Dryden and the government. And despite the numerous rulings against him, Dryden still refused to give in to the government's demands. And eventually, the council decided to take matters into their own hands Dude. and decided to demolish the structure themselves. Bro. So on June 20th, 1991, Harry Collinson, a demolition team, and a group of police constables traveled to Dryden's property to demolish the structure. Before this group arrived, the decision was made that should Dryden attempt to escalate the situation, they were to immediately Dude, you're gonna back take out his house that he built? Plan to avoid What's any up, sort man? of physical are you, bro? At the scene, numerous reporters had already began gathering at the property line, Damn. including a cameraman for the BBC, who was there to document the feud in real time. And right from the start, it was clear that Dryden was not going to be going down without a fight. Damn. The gate to his property was chain-locked, with Dryden standing behind it, pointing to two letters that he believed proved that he should be able to keep his structure intact, at least for the time being. Read that, that's an official letter, and there's an appeal in. There's an inspector coming out on this site in five weeks' time. Well, it doesn't show that. I'm ready to show Well, that. I have another letter. Confirming that. Confirming I'm not going to show you the other letter, but I, there's a... There's a this chap's coming out in five weeks' time. Well, all his arm asking is to wait five weeks for the outcome, maybe six weeks. It'll take a week after he's been out. I'm satisfied, Albert, that there's nothing in these documents that affects the Dude, look at how old this shit is, bro. <laughs> like some JFK shit. However, Dryden's request for more time was clearly falling on deaf ears. And realizing this, Dryden began to grow more and more agitated with his tone quickly turning far more menacing. Oh God. If you don't open the gate. Dude, you're uh, gonna piss off Dryden, don't we'll do it. To, we'll obviously have to take the fence don't down piss, the, Don't piss so him off. If you want, you can have some time to remove the fence yourself to minimize the damage. Do you want to do that? Yeah. Any damage that's subsequently caused as a result of you preventing us doing that is, will be your liability. Well, you may not be around to see the outcome of this disaster. Now, you've been warned. You will, 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 wait, year. you may but not be around, is that what he said? At this point, based on their initial plan, the crew should have certainly turned back, as it was now getting to the point that Dryden was outright threatening Collinson warning him that if he were to step on his property, that something awful was going to happen. Dude, oh God. And though this did cause Collinson to take a few steps back, 
he still remained steadfast in carrying out the task and remained on the edge of the property line, oh, God. standing his ground even when Dryden escalates the situation even further. What the Lord don't know? Go ahead, sir. And you got a shot at this gun. Oh, shit! As the two stand face to face, Dryden brandishes his pistol and points it directly at Collinson. And wanting to ensure the man's combative behavior was being documented, Collinson asks the cameraman to get a shot of his gun. Why can't they just let the man, like, gun, why do they care about the house so much? Leads to this moment. And you got a shot at this gun. Out of it. In an instant, with cameras rolling, Dryden fires a shot directly into the chest of Harry Collinson, oh. and then fires another at the crowd standing before him, leading to things devolving into a chaotic scene of running and screaming. As more shots were fired no from the way. pistol, the camera crew and Look North reporter Tony Belmont ran for cover. We were standing, we were standing watching what was going on, and then a shot rang out at the chief planner, fell to the ground, and I, uh, I heard, felt a shot in the arm. And I've clearly been Damn, shot here in the arm. Bro. As the camera crew finally gets to a safe distance and catches their breath, it's revealed that one of the journalists for the BBC had been struck in the arm, along with one of the officers. Though in the midst of all this carnage, we see no sign of Harry Collinson, as by this point, he was likely still on the ground where he had originally fallen, dead from his gunshot wound, Dude. with his final words being, And he got a shot at this gun. Following the incident, police would engage in a standoff with Dryden, who claimed that he had set up booby traps and landmines, along with other <laughs> explosives on the property. Bro, this guy's going, this is home alone, but fucking adult version. But he has booby traps everywhere? Though this would turn out to be a bluff, and eventually he would be grabbed by officers and taken into custody, oh, shit, where mind. he would subsequently be tried and sentenced to life in prison. Dude. And despite his actions on that day, <laughs> Albert Dryden would go on to become somewhat of a national hero, growing a legitimate fan base for the way he stood up against the government. Dryden would live out his time in prison until 2017 when he suffered a massive stroke, no, to which he was damn. let out on a compassionate release, with the man eventually passing away just one year later. Though his actions that day will forever be immortalized as one of the most notorious and darkest moments in television history. Dude, that's insane, bro. Yo, you know what's I crazy? I want to give a big thank you to Sen You know what's crazy, chat? Is my fucked up ass wants to see the entire like the full video right there, bro. That like I'm I'm weird. Alright. I wanna go like look it up and watch it. Cause I'm fucked up. I am. I'll say it. But goddamn Nick Crowley, bro. I think we're gonna have to watch all his god uh, like all his videos. I I'm not even kidding. We might have to watch all of his videos. Not not today, but like over time. Um, that was amazing. That was the first one. We've never seen any of them. And I think he has five of those ones, and then he's got some other ones, dude. So, shit. I'm ready. Nick Crowley, let's get it.